Okay, hi. Um, so like they mentioned, I'm Marina Moore. I'm a PhD student at NYU. I work with um, Dr. Justin Kapos in the um, Secure Systems Lab there. And I contribute to Tuff and various other um, open source projects. And I talk a little bit today about some of the lessons I've learned through working in the secure software supply chain space about cryptographic signatures and what they like, do and don't provide um, for your systems. So um, if, you, you know, if you're here today at um, Cloud Native Security Conference, you've probably heard a little bit about these cryptographic signature things. Um, you know, it's a bunch of math that, does, that provides a cryptographic guarantee that a particular private key signed a data, and you can verify this using a public key associated with that private key. Some you may have heard of include um, ED25519, EDDSA, RSA, and, and many others that aren't listed here. So make sure we're on the same page in case this is the first you've ever heard of a cryptographic signature. Kind of an overview of, of how these work is that um, you, know, you have one entity with a private key that signs an artifact or really any message that contains some content that they're signing. This the artifact and the signature that's kind of attached to the artifact is then sent to a verifier or really to anyone who then can use a public key that's you know, cryptographically linked to this private key they can use that key to then verify the artifact and really ensure that the signature came from the private key like it was supposed to. But OK, so what does this actually mean for, you know, for us making um, secure systems? The main guarantee that, is this still working? You're good? OK. So, um, the main guarantee that um, is, is, is given by a cryptographic signature is that at one point in time, some entity that controlled this private key decided to sign this message or this artifact. Um, but it doesn't really say, like, that's the only guarantee you really get. And you can do a lot of really quite powerful things with this mechanism, but on its own, it doesn't have a lot of, um, like, semantic meaning by itself. But if we put these signatures in context with a lot of other policies and rules and kind of, um, you know, formulations, you can really get a lot out of this system. So some of the things to kind of think about, and we're going to go into a lot more detail about some of these, is um, who should sign? Like, who controls this private key that is then signing information? How do you know that they actually control this private key? Um, uh, what, 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 what is each key allowed to sign? Um, what should you do if something is not signed? Or if the verification fails, like, what are, what are your next steps? What do you do then? And what do you do if this key ends up in the hands of the wrong person and you find out that this went wrong? And how should you store both the public and the private keys to ensure that they're um, properly accessed? So the first step in answering a lot of these questions is looking at why you actually want to use cryptographic signatures. I think a lot of people um, look at like you know distribution of artifacts or messages and say you know we need to sign them so that they're secure when they're when they're sent sent across. But I think it's important to think about what meaning you're hoping to get from that signature. Does the signature just mean that the correct person wrote the software that you're then receiving, or does it mean that like, you know, a security team reviewed this software and really, you know, ensure that that was also done? Or you can do, you can make very, various other um, guarantees around it, but you have to really like decide up front what it is you want to get from the signature on um, a piece of data. And another kind of general principle that I'm going to talk a lot about um, later on is this idea of compromise resilience, or what do you do when something goes wrong? So especially for the more critical assets that you um, find when you, when you look at a threat model of your system, uh, it's important to think of like if any one piece of the system is compromised, if any one key is lost, if any one server is compromised, or any other like piece of, of whatever system is being secured, what can you do to make sure that you can both recover from that compromise and maybe prevent the compromise from really, um, like you know, a single compromise from from getting bigger than, than it needs to. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about some various properties that you can put around cryptographic signatures to really give them some more meaning. And I think the first most important one of these properties is verification. Um, it gets great to have a signature on an artifact, but it's surprisingly common to have a, you know, a repository full of software artifacts and signatures, and then client systems that download the artifacts and ignore the signatures, in which case the signatures aren't really providing any semantic meaning at all, they're just there to, to make people feel like the, the code has been signed. Um, and so through verification, you can use the public keys to ensure that 
um, the artifact that you're downloading, you know, is the correct artifact. And a couple of questions to, um, to look at here are, which public key are you using for verification? And how do you know this is the public key um, that is correct? How did you get that? And what are you gonna do when this verification fails? Are you gonna, you know, fail open and download the software anyway, or fail closed and potentially, um, you know, leave the attack an attacker a way to denial of, denial of service your application by just issuing really bad signatures for a lot of different content. And there are definitely pros and cons to both of those approaches, but it's something that you need to think about, you know, upfront to not just default to, to one of them. The next topic is storage. Um, this, specifically, this is storage of the private keys that are used to sign um, artifacts. And the first kind of big decision is whether, sorry, these keys should be online or offline. Um, and the big advantage to having them be online is that you can have things be automatically signed. And this can really make it for um, seamless adoption because if, it, if the signing happens automatically, you know, you know that people won't just skip this step and it can happen without any kind of user interaction needed. However, because the keys are on you know, some server on the internet, um, they are more vulnerable to compromise than a key that's stored offline on something like a, you know, a YubiKey HSM or something that's, that requires some kind of human interaction to then connect it to another device to use it to create that signature. So these keys are harder to compromise, but they do require you know, that actual human step of, of connecting them, which can, might, might make it so that these signatures are used a little bit less often. And whether you're using online or offline keys, it's important to manage who has access to these keys. Um, for online keys, managing um, like credentials to access the, the servers where these keys are stored. And for offline keys, you know, deciding you know, if there's a safe, who has keys to that safe, or if there's like, just like you know, a drawer in the office, whose who's, who's, um, office is that drawer in, that kind of situation. The next issue is establishing trust. So how do you, once you have these, pub, these private keys that are signing the data, you have these associated public keys, which you know, you can distribute these widely because they're public keys, they don't need to be kept secret, but you do want to ensure that, um, you know, you know what public key you have and you know that this public key is associated with an identity that you trust for, for a particular operation. And there are various ways to do this. I think there's a lot of very cool technologies out there that can um, establish kind of a trusted channel to, com to communicate this. I think the, the, you know, the classic old fashioned method would just be to meet up in person and say, you know, this, this is the key that, that I control. This is the public key. Um, you know, you know, I'm, you know, it's mine because I'm giving it to you in person and you can kind of fake these online through using a variety of different methods. And then there's another method that gets, it's got, it's a lot of, you know, bad press, but it's a surprisingly useful one, which can be trust on first use. I think the dangerous thing about trust on first use is when you look at, um, like ephemeral clients and other things where every use is a first use. But if it's um, you know, a client system that's gonna be accessing the same repository over and over again, um, trusting that the first time you connect to it, you happen to get the correct, um, you know, the correct key and then using that key over and over again can actually be a, a reasonable method to ensure this as well. And that's actually very commonly used um, when connecting to um, servers over, um, yeah, when like authenticating to servers on the internet, this often says, gives you a fingerprint, you know, the first time you connect, like, you know, does this look like the correct server? And if you, um, and if you say yes, then you can, from then on your computer recognizes that server that you're connecting to. So next is placing limitations on the trust of each public key that you're using. So there's some dangers to having kind of a universal trust where you have a single key ring that has every single public key that you use for throughout your application. Because if any single private key associated with one of those public keys that you trust is compromised, then the person who compromises that key can then sign anything in the entire system. And you'll, you'll interpret it as valid because you trust that key for any of these different pieces. There's a couple of different ways that you can add some limitations on the trust so that a key compromise um, isn't as big of a deal. And you can achieve a little bit more of this compromise resilience that I talked about earlier. So the first way you can place limitations on trust is through the use of delegations. Um, one of the kind of nice pieces of delegations is that they can be used to also use, be used to prevent sharing of keys between members of an organization. So the idea of a delegation is that if you trust a particular private key or a particular identity to sign something, that identity can then pass on some amount of that trust to another entity. So, um, in general, they want you, want you want them to pass on a subset or at least 
you know, only what they are, are allowed to sign, right? So you say, you know, in this example I have here, um, if you have a person trusted to sign the Ubuntu project and they have an intern who joins the team, instead of giving this intern the power to also sign anything in the Ubuntu project, you can just give them um, a specific key that can be used for the documentation or for whatever project or subset of this project that they're actually using. The next um, kind of big way to prevent um, or to add this, this, this sense of limiting trust is through the use of multi-signatures or threshold signature um, signing. And the idea here is that you require multiple different keys, to, multiple different private keys to sign the same artifact. And then as a verifier, you ensure that um, both, like multiple different public keys that you use to then verify it come up with the same results so that you can see that, you know, that the hash is matched basically, that both of these keys sign the same artifact and therefore you have this kind of additional level of assurance that, um, that you can trust it. And you can set these thresholds to, you know, to whatever you want depending on the, the criticality of the particular piece or the, of, of, the, um, of the process. Um, and there's also ways you can achieve um, similar multi-signature properties using different cryptographic primitives. If you want like a, a fancy way to do this with um, variations of, um, of like sharding of keys and other, other technologies to achieve kind of a, a more enforceable version of the same property. And now I'm gonna talk a little bit about a few projects that, that I work on or at least um, am adjacent to you that have used signatures in practice and talk a bit about some of the, these um, decisions that were made in these projects and maybe hopefully give you some context if you ever have to make some of these decisions um, for your own projects about like the kinds of trade-offs um, that you have to make. So the first project I wanna talk about is Notation, which is kind of a, a subset of the Nerdy V2 effort. Um, and specifically, it's kind of the, the signing solution. It's the piece that really just provides signatures that can go on registries. And it uses this artifact manifest reference type um, in order to achieve that. And the notation um, really focuses on the signing aspect and having the signatures and artifacts on, sorry, having signatures that are attached to artifacts on a registry. And it leaves a lot of this context and kind of policy decisions up to the end user and kind of allows each user of the system to set kind of their own policy decisions about like the number of keys that need to be used in order to sign a particular artifact or which keys should be used to verify in all of these different pieces. And this is partly to add some flexibility um, so that notation can be used across different kinds of registries that have different kinds of users with different needs. And so it, it kind of um, allows people to do all of those different things. Another signing solution in kind of a similar vein is cosign, which I think, which um, is sig store signing solution, which is and in many ways similar to notation. It adds um, signatures to um, artifacts on OCI registries using slightly different APIs. And it really focuses on this idea of usability. And one of the big pieces of context that Cosign kind of adds in is this integration with another six-tier project called Recor, which is a transparency log. So um, any artifact that is signed with Cosign, that signature is automatically uploaded to Recor, which means that it is um, fully auditable in, on the immutable log. So Anyone in the future can go through and see, you know, when this artifact was signed and, um, you know, make sure there was no, no, no tampering going on in that situation. Next, I'll talk about a couple of projects that focus a lot more on the context around these signatures. So first of all, there's the Update Framework, or TUF, which is a compromise resilient framework for secure software update and distribution. And this really adds in a lot of these different mechanisms that I've talked about on top of just signatures themselves including things like delegations, um, throughout the delegations that chain all the way up to these offline root keys that Tuff kind of mandates. And it also includes um, the option for thresholds at all the different levels of the Tuff framework. There's actually ongoing integrations of Tuff both into, into both notation and cosine, just to, to be clear for those, those watching. And so these things aren't mutually exclusive. This is just, um, yeah, some additional policy that's added on here. There's also some flexibility in, in Tuff, which includes how developers actually manage um, the keys. So like the, that kind of online versus offline decision, Tuff mandates that at the, the root keys of the system are stored offline, because this is kind of the root of trust for the system, and so the most critical piece. Um, but developers can decide whether it makes more sense for them 
at the developer level to store these keys online or offline and, and how to manage them themselves. Another piece of um, context that Tuff adds in, that Tuff leaves to individual um, users is how to do root key distribution. So Tuff actually handles the distribution of all non-root keys through the framework itself. It has policies and mechanisms that basically use delegations in order to distribute keys. But these all train back up to these root keys, which, which then still need to be distributed. Um, a lot of systems using Tuff do use trust on first use, but there, it, it also supports any other kind of key distribution mechanism, you know, depending on what can be set up in a particular context. And this kind of depends on the kind of the closeness between the person downloading the software and the person like uploading the, the, the software to be downloaded and how much they're able to communicate in order to do this secure root key distribution. And also as Tuff supports these thresholds, but deciding you know, whether you should have a threshold of one or a threshold of 50 um, really depends on your particular uses and whether um, for a particular role, it makes more sense to set it in a different place. The final piece I wanna talk a bit about is Intoto, which is a framework for software supply chain security. Um, it, Intoto allows users to set policies for all the different stages of the software supply chain and what they expect to happen at these different stages, and then allows the users to verify that all these different steps happened. And one of the really interesting kind of pieces of context that Intoto adds is really about this identity. Because, because Intoto goes across the entire supply chain, it needs to um, keep track of the public keys that should be used to verify each step in the supply chain. Um, and it really it does a, a great job, I think, of tying um, the identity to the specific step that that identity should be used to sign to really ensure that each key is, is used for the thing that it's supposed to be used for. It's similar to Tough, it supports thresholds for each of these stages as well. So in certain cases, for example, you may want um, the code to be, you know, signed off by more than one different developer to ensure that, you know, you've had more than one set of eyes on the code. And you can enforce that using say, thresholds in Intoto. Um, yeah, and this really defines those identities across the supply chain. That's kind of what I have. Here's some contact info for me. Let me know if you have any questions or anything else. I think you went a little under time, but let me know if anything else you want to talk about. Yes. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Okay. Andres. Marina, great presentation. Say yeah. someone starting off with Intoto, can you elaborate what's an approach to formulate a layout? What does that entail? Yeah, I did go through that a little fast. So yeah, the, um, basically what it means is looking at how your software goes from the developer to the end user, looking at all the different stages. It usually involves some kind of you know, code being uploaded, some kind of CI CD system, some kind of build system, some kind of distribution system, plus maybe some other steps depending on, on what you do. So the first step is really defining what those steps are for you. What systems are you using? What machines or people are responsible for each of those different steps? And then I don't have um, pictures of it or anything, but Intoto has you know, specific formats basically that you just put all that information into. And then it can, and then if you actually follow those steps of the supply chain, you can then use Intoto to verify that each of these steps happened. So you don't map like pseudocode from those two steps. You actually just fill out parameters into an Intoto template, let's say. Yeah, okay. yeah exactly, Intoto template. That, that's what you would use. <laughs> Have you seen that work? Um, you know, I was following on CNCF Slack and I saw someone had posted a tool that took a Tekton chains um, and turned that into an Intoto layout. Uh, what do you think about th that type of uh, method for generating these layouts? I think that's a great idea. Yeah, I think that um, being able to kind of automate that process and use the tools that already exist to do it is, is a great idea. All right. Any more questions? Yeah. All right. Well, hey, thank you so much. And, you know, Marina's been such a, uh, she, she's been giving so much to the open source community. And I just really want to thank her for the work she's been doing and, and great talk. Thank you.